Okay, so good morning, students of the Word. Um, those of you watching on video, we're welcoming to you also. Um, last week, we continued our Spiritual Gifts and Evangelism series entitled, excuse me, entitled Into All the World by continuing to talk about the spiritual gift of faith. Um, we got a couple or three people that we've not seen in a number of weeks. So, talking about the spiritual gift of faith, and we have discussed how that it's impossible to please God, as Scripture says, without faith. Uh, you've got to have faith in order to be in Christ, but this gift is an extra measure, if you will, an extra measure of faith. Uh, we reviewed the question, is the weather any different over there than it is in the South Fork? <laughs> North Fork? Um, we, <laughs> sorry, couldn't resist. We reviewed the uh, questionnaire about how each of us views prayer in the context of our Christian walk. We had the three questions and how our answers gave insight into understanding this gift, um, we discussed some potential dark aspects of this gift and then talked about the story of Abraham. You remember, he was 100 years old even before he was able to have a child. And, well, he may have been a little younger than that when, when he had uh, his first child, but I see, uh, the child of promise. And then God says, go offer your son. We talked about how Isaac and Jake, uh, or Isaac and Abraham, are walking along with, with the bundle of wood and the fire, and and how Abraham, when asked, says, oh, "God's going to take care of it. God, God will provide the lamb." We looked at chapters two, four, and part of chapter five of James, and examined our measure of faith as it relates to James stating when the elders. Pray in faith for a person who is sick, they will be healed. Uh, remember, I, I stated, I don't believe that anyone has the power to lay on hands and heal as the apostles had and as some that they laid hands on had because those individuals had been given power by God to do the healing themselves. Today, it's the prayer of faith, calling on God in childlike faith that he will provide the power that supplies the healing. We examined a story about Jesus and his ability to do miracles in his hometown. And we read the account in Matthew 13. Next slide, please. In Matthew 13, but let's look at a parallel account in Mark 6. Um, and Leonard has, uh, is going to read for us Mark 6, verses 1 through 6. Now, Jesus has been out. Remember, he was across the lake. He healed the little girl. He's come back. He is now at his hometown. Jesus went out from there and came into his hometown, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and the many listeners were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things, and what is the, this wisdom given to him? And such miracles as these performed by his hands. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James and Jose, and Judas, Simon, Next slide. Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his own relatives and his own household. And he could not, and he could do no miracles there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he wondered at their disbelief. And he was going around the village. All right. I asked
ask the question, is it possible for us to limit the Spirit in His power? Um, I think it's Paul that talks about quenching the Spirit. You remember how the Spirit appeared on the day of Pentecost? What did it, what did it look like? Tongues of fire. Get that fire hose out. Quench the spirit. Now, we know that spirit is pneuma, which means air, which means uh, wind. Um, but in that case, he appeared as tongues of fire. So, is it possible to limit the spirit today? Don, you're shaking your head. Got a comment to go along with the shake? Ignore. Ignore it. And the thing is, we have. I have never asked and not received. When I needed something, whether it was Katie's or Rita or Heather, it's always there. You know, and that feeling of having an understanding. But we can avoid asking at times and put our matter on God. We can look to us. used a word, ignore. Who do we ignore? Somebody that's we don't want to be bothered by? Right? What do we ignore? Something that we don't want to mess with. We don't want, we don't want to be involved with. We ignore. And we ignore the spirit sometimes. Or at least, let me speak for myself. Sometimes you. I think I always said St. John of Brown, I said, in time, I've learned to fish it. Especially the new age. We have gone there and we quench their spirit by sometimes what we say or what we don't say, or the lack of love, or lack of attention, and so on and so forth. And then we do that to each other. So we ignore something that's not important to us. Wow. Imagine amazing God. Now, Leonard's translation said something about wonder, I think. He wondered at their disbelief. Yeah, right. The, the New Century says he was amazed at how many people had no faith. Can you imagine amazing God? But you want to always amaze him in a good way, right? Not this way. He was amazed at, where's their faith? They don't have any faith. They're ignoring the spirit. It doesn't matter. Jesus was amazed by their lack of faith, so it wasn't a good thing that amazed God in the flesh. But this person with this gift has a different level of faith than what a Christian without this gift possesses. Um, this person doesn't ignore the Spirit. This person doesn't quench the Spirit. His or her faith is their gift from the Spirit, and so they have a completely different view of things. We talked about the fact that they deal oftentimes on the non-visual plane rather than what we actually see. And I refer to Elisha, I believe it is, who um, said, Lord, open his eyes, the prophet, when his 
servant said, what are we supposed to do? We're surrounded here. Absolutely certain this person is that God will provide. When all, you know, I don't have this gift, and so all I see are obstacles and impossible situations. I look around, I see the raging sea, I see that we're about to capsize. This person sees a way to get to Jesus. Walking on that water. He even invited me. I see only a knife. Fire. Some wood. The person with this gift knows that God is going to provide a lamb. Even if it's not right in front of us. Even if we can't see it. Even if we don't understand how it's going to get there. It will get there. This person says, God's going to provide. God's going to provide. And so when the fire is burning low in the congregation, and it looks as if it might go out, or there's a lot of discouragement, the person with this gift is the glowing coal that jumps in and causes the wood all around to just burst into flames and allows God to um, We heard a speaker last Sunday night talk about the camp, the Diggett camp, which is now something hollow, Happy Hollow. Um, he commented about the fact that he had never asked, never asked for any contributions, but God always provided. And. I think our elders have talked about that. I think they talk about the fact that we get a need come up. God opens the coffers. And God, if we allow him, if we don't ignore him, will amaze us. We can appreciate how this person can be instrumental then in strengthening the church by inspirational faith and strengthening each of us, praying with others, standing firm in the belief that God can. But this helping the body grow spiritually through faith, that's half the equation, isn't it? Because the growth of the body is growing in faith and in numbers. We talked about that early on in our study. Can a person with this gift help the church grow numerically? Let's look at Acts 11. We have reference here to a man of faith. The church has been dispersed from Jerusalem because of the per persecution Saul is wreaking upon the saints. So, some Christians have gone to Cyprus, some to Phoenicia. Denny, next slide, please. I want you to get a perspective here, because I had no idea when I read this. I thought, where in the world is Phoenicia? I, I don't know. So, you've got Jerusalem here. You've got Damascus, where Paul was en route when he was converted. You've got Samaria. You've got Galilee, where Jesus, a lot of his ministry was. Christians have been scattered from Jerusalem up to, we know Philip went to Samaria, Phoenicia. Oh. Hello. I, I thought that only happened on my iPad. Anyway, <laughs> Phoenicia, and then on up there at the top that now is off the screen, we have Cyprus. Okay, here's the Antioch that we're going to talk about where Paul uh, goes. Um, but we got Phoenicia, and so they've gone north primarily. Okay, um, slide, slide, Jericho. It's another map, I guess, where we could have seen. So, about how far are we talking about here from? Jerusalem to go up, since we've got the map up here, we'll talk about this later, but about how far to go up to Antioch. Now this is modern day Syria. There's an Antioch up here. Well, actually it's more over here, because it's pretty much
straight north of Cyprus. That's modern-day Turkey. And this one, of course, is a lot further. But this Antioch from Jerusalem is about 300 miles. So approximately a two-week walk if they average 20 miles a day or so. But that's a mountain. Right, and it's not air. It's not as the crow flies. We're talking about the road that goes up to. So, yeah. It's about a hundred miles from uh, Caesarea to uh, Caria, as, as the map shows. So, yeah. So you're talking about, of course, they're not going to walk across that. But, right. Uh, anyway, that's about what it is. Okay. The um, Christians have gone to Cyprus, they've gone to Phoenicia, they've gone to Antioch. And there are a lar large number of Jews in Antioch that were receptive to the gospel, but also, apparently, some Gentiles. Because this is out of Jewish territory, even though uh, the early teachers would go to the synagogue, the early preachers would go to the synagogue to begin preaching in the area. And so Antioch became a large influential congregation. Uh, if we look over now, next slide please, in Acts 11, they have been discussing um, Uh, they've heard about, the church in Jerusalem has heard about all this growth north of them. And so they heard about all this, so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Now, it's interesting that Scripture describes some of these individuals. I mean, uh, if we have the seven deacons, uh, there's a description of some of them. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit, and full of faith. Does anybody else have something besides full of faith there? Okay. When he reached Antioch and saw how God had blessed the people, he was glad. He encouraged all the believers in Antioch, if this encouraged is encourager, uh, exhorter, he encouraged all the believers in Antioch always to obey the Lord with all their hearts, and many people became followers of the Lord. So some of the people that were meeting weren't already believers, and it was his encouragement that caused them to become followers of the Lord. So this gift of faith is important for helping those who have already become part of the body, as we've talked about, and for bringing previously unbelievers into the fold of believers. You see that? We mentioned the dark side of this gift um, and some items there. Do, do you think of any other things that might be a dark side of the gift of encouragement? You get to suck the straw right from yeah, I hadn't thought of that one. I'm encouraging to the other. Right, right. The person that, of course, the spirit. If we if if we turn to the spirit, the spirit should refill us, mm -hmm. and so maybe if that happens, then we're not. But everybody needs encouragement, right? Elders need encouragement. Preachers need encouragement. Each of us needs encouragement. What questions or comments do you have about this spiritual gift? Any? Gift of encouragement. I would make an observation that it this seems to be a gift that is not attributed to men, not gifted to men, at least by specific mention in the New Testament. Um, Old Testament characters are mentioned, 
but in the New Testament, we, we've got a really restricted list. Stephen is called a man of faith in Acts 6. And Barnabas, as we read in Acts 11, is called a man of faith. I couldn't find anybody else that was described that way. Um, a specifically attributed this spiritual gift to that person. Now, of course, we've got demonstrations of faith in the New Testament. We know the apostles had faith. I mean, I've talked about Peter walking on the water. We cast stones at him because he sank, but he saw a way to get to the Lord. Um, we've got demonstrations of faith such as Paul's on the ship that was sailing from Fair Haven, or Fair Havens, I guess it is. Um, but Scripture never describes Paul as a man of great faith in the way it does with Stephen and Barnabas. Maybe it's just a freak. I don't know. We know he had it, though, by the way he lived. You recall how he knew that going to Jerusalem was probably going to be the end of the line for him. Because on his way to Jerusalem, he meets with the elders from Ephesus. He says, I'm not going to see you guys again. But he still was determined he was going to go to Jerusalem. Well, and, he more prone to rather than encouraging uh, to tell people, um, you know, I can force you to do this, mm -hmm. but I'd rather just ask you. Yeah. But now that you bring that up, when we study 2 Corinthians, we can see the way that he kind of prodded them along rather than get out the cattle prod and the whip. Uh, back in my granddad's day in the sail barn, they didn't use cattle prods. They just had these whips that stood up about like this. And I used to love to play with granddad's whip. Smack yourself right in the ass. All right. I'm trying to go after my sisters. All right. <clears throat> but he was determined to go to Jerusalem in spite of the visions that he'd had. And so it's not to say, just because we just have Stephen and Barnabas named, it's not to say there were no others that had this gift of faith. I'm sure there were. Uh, but Barnabas and Stephen are the only two singled out. And, of course, we can read a lot of uh, Old Testament characters in Hebrews 11. Yeah, I do, because, I mean, it was obvious. Paul Paul got down in the dumps sometimes. In the letter he writes to um, Timothy, bring my coat. You know, before you enter, if you can, it's cold here. He didn't say have that, but, you know, and bring the scrolls. You could see that Paul was needing somebody to kind of light, light his fire. Now, the apostles, we have to remember, the apostles had all these gifts in a significant measure. And they were able to give some of the gifts to others, teaching, prophecy, even healing. Because Philip was able to heal, but he couldn't pass it on to anybody. But the apostles could. So, we have to remember, they had all these gifts. And the Spirit gave the gifts to them. The Spirit gives us a gift or more. But as he wishes. As, as it fits his purpose, exactly. As it's going to benefit the body where an individual is. And also in Hebrews, part of the reason they get such an amplification of this is the context in which Hebrews is being pointed. They were they were looking for Then if they if, if it's like you say, it's the spirit for life and yeah. as in that as, as to the uh, to the uh, help the church. I mean help the body. Yeah. Strength.
great thing in growth. I love to tell him, man, do you see in the flesh? All right. Next slide, please. Our next spiritual gift, number 10, encouragement, a.k.a. exhortation. Um, That was, we were talking about faith, although it is encouragement. Okay, here. Uh, so we were talking about men of faith. Barnabas was a man of faith. Next spiritual gift is encouragement. There's a special function given by God's Spirit to certain members of Christ's body to encourage and console the distressed and provide positive and practical steps for others to follow. I apologize that it seemed like I was kind of confused there when, I, when we first started. <laughs> Sorry. I was ahead of us. Um, the gift of encouragement. We were talking about men of faith, Stephen and Barnabas. Those were the ones who were named. There were others who were men and women of faith, but they were only one. Name. The gift of encouragement is mentioned in, next slide please, Romans 12 where uh, we have the listing of the gifts. Whoever has the gift of encouraging should encourage. And then it goes on to name some others. Do you recall back when we were studying the gift, uh, spiritual gifts of preaching and teaching and shepherding, we looked at three words that are all in one scripture and they are all in Next slide, please. Titus chapter 1. Let's turn to that. Because the scripture itself is not on the board here. Titus chapter 1, verse 9. Oops. Where Paul writes, he's talking about in verse 5, appoint elders, and then he gives qualifications, and then he says the overseers are to be holding on to the trustworthy word just as we teach it. Overseers can help by using true teaching and can show those who are against the true teaching that they are wrong. So we've got three words here. We've got... Uh, Logos is the word. And he talks about using the word here. Parathaleo, which is to exhort or encourage, but it's also rendered teach in some passages. We've got this, I think it's electro, uh, which is refute or correct. And then we've got betascalia, which is teaching, and it also refers to in its noun form, doctrine. The verb form, of course, is teaching or teach. Teaching is the noun. Uh, teach is a verb. So we've got exhort slash encourage slash parakaleo. We've got convict slash refute slash correct alecho. And we've got teaching or doctrine or that which is taught didascalia. Well, preaching, we know, is a separate gift. We've already talked about that. Teaching is a separate gift. We've talked about that. And encouragement, exhortation, is a separate gift. There's, as we've seen in a number of these gifts, there is significant overlap among them, but they're each unique. They each have a particular characteristic that others that they overlap with do not have. And even so, this gift of encouragement overlaps with these, but it also overlaps with the spiritual gift of faith that we were just discussing. In those, um, we might say those who have the gift of faith provide hope. They can see the unseen. They can describe 
what's going to happen uh, by faith. While one with this gift of encouragement or exhortation provides practical steps to take on the journey to spiritual growth and out of doubt. Before we go any further, I want to remind you uh, of something. I may have stated this before, or possibly I just hinted at it. If your church work that you're doing is not enjoyable to you, then what you're doing is not your gift. If it's a burden, it's not your gift. You are using what the Spirit gave you, as we talked about, as a gift when your work is not, doesn't feel like work. Then you're using your gift. But rather, it's not work, it's rather, it's joy. It's fulfilling. This kind, this is kind of like the saying, um, work at something you love and you never have to work. What's this all about? So if you dread doing church work, you're not putting your effort into the area of your spiritual gift. As effort, work in that area, it's not hard. It doesn't feel, it doesn't feel like work. So if you're a Christian and you're a question, does that mean that you shouldn't do it? <laughs> it means you better find what feels like this isn't work. This is, this is something I want to do. Housework's a little different. So, sometimes it has to be done. Hey, is that my favorite thing? No. Yeah. So, Denny? How many of us can walk on our hands? I can barely walk on my feet. I mean, it just can be done. So we're talking about as the Spirit, the Spirit wills. I mean, as yes. the Spirit is the one that, it's not us deciding, <clears throat> apparently. should be doing all of these things. And quite honestly, you see that in Scripture. We're all to be encouraged. I mean, this assembly today, if, it, if, if you are not, if I am not being encouraging to my brothers and sisters, then something's wrong. Mm. But sometimes I need encouragement. Sometimes you need encouragement. Sometimes we uh, just maybe can't give that out at that moment. We need to receive. But, so we're all involved in a lot of these. What, uh, well, like you, I think you mentioned doing like a spark plug a while back or something like that, but um, it's, it's kind of where we, uh, where we shine or where, you know, what, what God is doing through us. And Mark's point is well taken, I think. We, uh, we, we get what? God has given us. And, and in this way, I mean, if, it's, if somebody's down, maybe the shepherd wants to send somebody that can encourage them. Right. You know, that's maybe the way that works. And if someone's sick, why does he call the elders to pray? Because the prayer of faith accomplishes the good. Um, go ahead. I think you hit on why this Thing to do because as a Christian, this is what I do. I, I mean, we're jumping. 
all around this because it's hard. Yeah. And that's why that's why we have to study it and 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 try to be led in the into a greater understanding because it, it's it's not easy because like Mark was saying, if I see something that needs to be done even though I don't like to do it, I need to be disciplined enough to say, This needs to be done, I'm going to do it. Now, is that my gift? Maybe, maybe not. But that I think that's why this is hard. This is why we have to study it. This is why we sometimes are brain talking. And I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. And the situation that you're talking about, if I put a wall right down between Aaron and Joni. And this is a new congregation. That anybody in that congregation is going to have a lot more responsibility to keep that group going beyond their particular gift than if we include everybody in the congregation. And so smaller groups where maybe you've got three or four women and two or three men and you're needing to teach some little people and nobody has that spiritual gift, somebody's going to need to do it. And then, then you get back to do you commit and do you trust God yeah. to provide what's needed at those locations? And, and a lot of times then you see the spiritual gift. I think it's Leonard that's mentioned that sometimes, you know, you or maybe Bill, you, you have things that you kind of grow into. Uh, and yes, yeah. I mean, I probably would not feel as comfortable standing up here had I not done so many, 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 many consecutive Sundays as a 13 or 14 year old. Uh, because our congregation had four men, if you counted me as one, at 10 or 11 years old, who could read, serve at the table, preach, lead singing. And really, uh, only a couple, sometimes three, could lead singing. Uh, and the other two, when they led, one of the women in the audience is basically <laughs> leading the group. You've been there, right? Yeah. You've been there. Same old one. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, I mean, that's the little congregation I met with up in Wisconsin, the same way. That they weren't blessed with any song leaders. Uh, but there were men that got up and started the songs, and they sang. And uh, we sang. Um, and so you see the, the talent that the Spirit provides may be of varying degrees also. So, you can tell if it's your spiritual gift or if it isn't by how easy it is for you to perform the task and how easy it is 
for you to go ahead and do what you're doing. Um, what brings the greatest joy? His purpose from God, from the Spirit, was to provide righteousness and take care of sin. Did uh, Christ have a little bit of uh, his body or no body? Mm -hmm. That was the human side. I mean, he didn't, he didn't desire to suffer, but he was willing to suffer. So, the important thing is, as we've mentioned, that the important thing is that the Spirit uses each person in a certain way, and we need to allow that to happen so that we're yielding and not <laughs> quenching the spirit. Okay? And that's why it's so important that you discover where the spirit wants you, what the spirit wants you to do. You know, whether you do that by talking to the elders, whether you do that through the questionnaire. I've, I've got questionnaires if you didn't get one, and you want to try to take that questionnaire and the graphic tools to help you discover your gift. Um, it's important. It's important. Quit, and then we'll get back to the gift of encouragement and exhortation next Sunday. Any other comments? Any, any time we can understand ourselves better, it allows us to temper areas where we struggle or, or where we're, you know, maybe have trouble and, and look for ways to strengthen areas that we have weaknesses. So anything we can do to understand ourselves better in light of who God is and who we are and where we are. And I like that scripture. Um, I used to think, wow, that's pretty scary. But seek out your own salvation with fear and trembling, as the King James says, because it's each of us interacts with God on an individual basis. God has certain expectations for everyone, but we each individually interact with God. Thank you. <laughs>